Welcome to another episode of the Informing Choices mini pod. Since the pandemic, remote and hybrid working have become part of the workplace planning lexicon. But with the debate about the pros and cons of working away from the office still in full flight, change is also being fueled by increasingly sophisticated automation technologies, which in turn offers the attractive potential of significant cost savings afforded by downsizing office accommodation. So the social pressures to change how we work, the technological pressures to change what work we do, and the economic pressures to optimize physical assets and reduce costs, all combine to suggest that change in what the office is and how we use it is likely to accelerate. To explore the future of the office in the second half of this century, I'm delighted to be joined by Associate Director at Colliers International, Harriet Wiseman. So Harriet, we're going to talk about the role of flexibility in establishing successful workplaces, developments in material production, and the key challenges for successful future workplaces. So let's start with this. So what do you think will be the key to the success of workplaces in 2050? How might flexibility be integrated and evolve the built environment? Yeah, I mean, this is such an exciting topic, Steve. I'm so happy to be here to talk about it. So when we think about 2050, you know, that's 27 years away. And in context of, you know, what the difference between now and 27 years in the past was, that was 1996. And the kind of huge change in the way that we work and therefore the environments that we work in has been, you know, insane. So I think we're we're really going to see some very exciting things happen. Definitely the rise of digital technology is the change in nature of work. I mean, as, as you kind of mentioned earlier in, in the intro, the pandemic's really a massive catalyst for change in terms of remote working and actually more kind of global um, connection via um, lovely things like this, like Zoom. Yeah. Um, but that in itself, we, we're already seeing has has had a huge impact on the built environment. It, imagining what that's going to be like in in you know twenty odd years is is so exciting. Um, and then also the um, the kind of increasing focus on employee well being, I think, is going to be really key. Um, just because you know we're human, and I think uh, there's some some things that have come out over the you know the past couple of years where actually we're all realizing that. Um, our experience and our health and our families and our friends and and all of that is just as important as work. <laughs> um, so you mentioned flexibility, so I think um, I'll, I'll start there. Um, we can already see how important flexibility is in the current iterations of our workplace. So um, we've you know got um, flexible partitions and you've got meeting rooms that have dividers and things like that. They've got so many challenges acoustically um but if we're thinking about kind of 20 27 years time the ability for buildings to be able to change dramatically um yet very easily to kind of suit the daily needs of the occupants um without requiring kind of major redesign um work is going to be is going to be vital so utilizing kind of modular walls, um, movable floors, movable ceiling systems that help buildings to kind of flex in size and configuration to suit the needs for that day for that company will be kind of essential, I think. At the minute, you know, I mentioned the kind of flexible partitions and, you know, reconfigurable furniture and things like that. But, um, but I think that actually, if you're thinking about it in 2050, it's going to be able to be done at the touch of a button or even kind of automatically via AI. And I think that's that's going to be really exciting. So you'll have these very dynamic buildings where floors might be able to kind of rotate independently of each other to give different views or, you know, to balance the heating and cooling requirements of where the sun is and, and um, you know, where the rain is. <laughs> Um, so we might see spaces like um, a kind of a huge auditorium with high ceilings and large screens um, being created um, just because AI can see that there's an all hands meeting in the diary for the next day. So it reconfigures kind of two floors 
um, that were once kind of separated into, you know, co co-working space into, you know, kind of this, this double height auditorium or, you know, the opposite of that. So you've got kind of a large space for a team to work, but actually the next day, um, the squad are looking at kind of really focused work. So automatically the, the, um, the infrastructure of the building will, will flex and change. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's going to be really fun. Um, I think as well, the, the function of the buildings are going to become more kind of multi-purpose. So we're already seeing quite a lot of mixed use development at the minute, but I think, you know, really increasing the utilization and the impact that the physical spaces have is going to become more and more vital. So I think what we're going to see is developments that combine, you know, office space, hotel space, hospitality space, community space, which is a bit similar to now. But I think we'll see it with this kind of seamless transition so that they can really kind of easily change functionality on kind of like an hourly basis. So you could have, you know, in the day, it's kind of for a company to come in and work. But between kind of six and seven, it's ready for um, a community group to come in and use it how they need to. And then, you know, a little bit later, maybe it's providing um, overnight accommodation. I think I think we're just going to see this real kind of exciting um, kind of flex in how things are able to um, function. I also think, you know, we're, we're talking about um, the workplace and, and I think the most important thing is that it's not static. So all of what I've been talking about is kind of a physical moving, but I think as well, the the kind of idea of um, pilot and testing spaces that are kind of built in to the physical space that um, allow teams to experiment with different formats or layouts or, you know, piloting new technologies or collaborating with different companies. Um, and it kind of collects data as they're as they're using the space and then implements solutions kind of accordingly after that, I think will be really exciting. We're, we're already seeing it a little bit with kind of pilot spaces with some of our clients at the minute. But um, I think that idea that it will adapt um, and like analyze success in real time and kind of constantly be improving is just going to be really exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should also say, you know, the practical part of all of this is that um, in order to enable all of that flexibility, um, we're going to have to have very adaptive infrastructure. So, you know, the kind of power systems, the HVAC systems, the lighting, the plumbing, the wiring, it's all going to need to be kind of modular and be able to kind of very easily move and adapt and change. So I think that's probably that's probably the jump that we're really that we're really looking um, to in order to enable all of this to happen. Um, but I think the like for me, what I can imagine happening is that once all of that kind of starts coming together, then we could have this concept of the floating office. So that's like these mobile workstations or you know workplaces that can be dropped into different locations. Um, allowing employees to work in kind of a destination of their choosing whenever they like. So if they were, you know, they're all kind of self-contained and they're able to be kind of dropped into areas by drones or um, kind of autonomous vehicles, and then they can be used as, you know, strategy sessions or team ideation um, sessions or uh, attracting and retaining talent because you know you can say well you can go and work in the rainforest you know of of Ecuador this week I think is that's that's kind of the dream but it's also really practical um, because companies could assemble these structures in kind of emerging markets so they could use them to test how their workforce responds to that market how their product or, or their service responds to that market um, and kind of connect with new talent pools um, without that kind of risk of permanence. So I think that's probably, yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you you're very excited. One of the threads, I think, that runs through everything that you've spoken about um, is, is people. And I guess 
we're almost getting used to the idea of our physical presence at work being replaced, at least in part, by some virtual presence, perhaps working in the metaverse. And there's a couple of things. I mean, firstly, I wonder, you know, what's your sense of that? What role do you think metaverse might play in how we think about working more flexibly in the future? And you also spoke quite a lot about uh, flexibility of use, of using kind of the, the physical space that you have there. And I just wonder if there's an opportunity, and, and, and I know this has kind of been trialed at least as a concept, if there's an opportunity to bring together workspaces and a vertical farm where you maximize the environmental opportunities there are between those two, those two places. What, what are your thoughts on those points? Oh, yes. Yes. So um, the environmental kind of farming and the idea um, of, of the concept of kind of buildings, the, the above and below of buildings also being really kind of utilised is is really, really, really exciting. And I think um, material development is only going to help that. And also it makes sense. Right. We, you know, we we want to be making the most out of um our buildings and our built environment we also are now very very conscious of the environmental footprint of that building so actually making sure that you know if you're if you're going to be using um concrete etc and actually i might i might just touch upon some kind of sustainable um building materials in a second but um but if you're going to be if you're going to be having an impact that could be negative, then you need to be thinking about not just kind of, you know, net zero, which is, you know, bringing something to a zero, bring, bringing it to null, you need to be having a positive impact. So I think looking at looking at farming and, and looking at how to um, regenerate spaces and, and bring something into the world and, and positively kind of bring something into the world is, is really important. Um, and I, I kind of touched upon materials there, but like there's there's some incredible um, developments happening at the minute, looking at sustainable kind of self healing materials that can repair themselves when they're damaged. Um, you know, self healing concrete, polymers, and coatings that, um, if they get exposed to certain conditions, can react in a certain way. So there's a building uh, called the Palazzo Italia in Milan that's got a facade made from a concrete that purifies the air around it. So, you know, that's now. So uh, if we can think about that in in 30 years time, and, and you're thinking about these buildings that actually, they can actively reduce the amount of pollution in our, in our big cities, um, but they can also, you know, say they're, they're made of a material that, that isn't flammable. So, you know, kind of tragedies like like Grenfell and things like that are just completely a thing of the past because the material of the building itself um, can can actively kind of protect the inhabitants. Um, yeah, I just, I think it's, I think it's really interesting. And I do think the kind of, you mentioned metaverse um, and I, I want to dive into that, but I also think that automation within the the materials and the the physical building is really interesting so we've got smart systems at the moment that can detect when a, a light bulb on the like third floor is you know failing or uh where a part of the aircon unit you know needs to be replaced and I know this sounds so boring but to me it's it's really you know it's already exciting but if you kind of amp that up and and think about the kind of um the implications of what that could mean in in 2050 it means that you know the the, the very fabric of the building itself might be able to notify us when it de detects irregular irregularities in the air so you know what what if rather than um you know just oh there's a light bulb failing you know what if it says oh uh you know there's actually the toxic the toxicity in the air is kind of it is gone up um that's kind of amp up the um the filtering that we've got going on outside and and try and make a positive impact to the air and then you can measure it and and see it so yeah i think i think there's some really exciting um things that can happen there 
Um, and I, and, and I guess one, just going back on that, I suppose one of the really interesting things about that is if you automate the monitoring, you can actually automate the remedial action as well. So whether that's robots or something about the um, ability of the fabric of the building to respond in some way, that can all be automated as well, I guess, when we're talking the second half of this century. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so you've got these, these. I mean, we use the term smart buildings now, but I think when we look back, we're going to, you know, they're going to, they're not going to look that smart. I think you're, you're going to have these, these really intelligent um, buildings that, that, you know, they keep themselves flexible. They're constantly adapting. They're constantly trying to work as hard as they can to adapt to the needs of the humans within them. But they're also, you know, positively um, affecting the, the air around them and affecting uh, the health and the well-being of, of the community around them. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's it's a really exciting direction to be going in and, and all of the work that, um, you know, scientists and developers are doing at the minute, kind of looking at, at materials and AI systems, as you say, that, you know, you're not going to have, um, you know, the, the facilities lead of the building isn't going to have to be concerned with, you know, the, the functionality of the light bulbs that will all just take care of itself. So instead, they can be focused on working with community groups and uh, reaching out to different startups and, you know, finding out from them what they what they would need from the building and would they like to borrow it for a couple of hours on a Sunday or, you know, there's 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 so much more. I think it will, it will free people up to um, to be able to really think about uh, the the impact that they're having too in their daily lives. Yeah, what's really interesting about that is it, it, it's almost as if you get rid of one job, but you create another one. So this kind of reskilling of how we manage buildings and, and the tasks that people do within that is, is likely to change. I just want to go back on, on one thing that you mentioned, which was about um, kind of new materials in buildings and how we use them. Um, I guess immediately what popped into my mind is the challenge, I suppose, uh, between refurbishing existing stock and actually building new. What are the opportunities for th for some of these materials in terms of refurbishment? Because I, I guess it makes sense if you've got an opportunity to build a new building, you use new materials. But what about refurbishment? Is is that an opportunity as well? Uh, do you know what? I, I've got to say I'm the biggest fan of refurbishment over new. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the structure's already there, the, um, the environmental impact you know, of building that building is already is already happened. Mm. So if you can utilize what we've already got, then that's um, going to be a much more um, kind of positive way of um, building and and changing. I, I think what we'll see is that you know you can you can adapt them. So there'll be there'll be ways to kind of we've already got Revit and you can you know model the buildings in 3D create these digital twins and then almost run um different scenarios over them so you know what if we did this and what if we did that and how would that work without um implementing it you know having to do trial and error in the in the physical in the physical world um which I guess actually kind of relates a bit to what you were saying about the metaverse but uh we'll go back to that for sure but um but yeah, so I think I think the best the best case scenario would be to be able to take uh, current existing buildings and refurbish them with these kind of these new um, materials and um, maybe look at kind of how the infrastructure itself could be adapted uh, to move and flex, as as I was kind of saying. So I definitely think yeah, re reuse reuse is is the best. Um, when when we're looking at it and also you get all the character of that building you know I think what's so special about why people love going to different cities is because everything has a different character because you've got the you've got the arch the the architecture reflects the history of of that space and that place and we don't want to lose that you don't want you don't want it all to become kind of homogenous across any global location you still want um, the kind of the local unique flavor and character so utilizing um, existing buildings and and retaining character and also developing you know 
the creative language of that space is yeah. is is really important i think what immediately came to mind when you were talking this and i and i and i would say this being in the well us, us both being in the uk is london seems to me to do that really well you know this kind of really gorgeous i think um combination of old and new uh, and you would imagine that you know that kind of combination is something that would be really important to the cultural wealth um, of the uh, of the country in um, 30, 40, uh, 50 years time. Um, I want to come back on, on metaverse. And you, you've, you've mentioned that, um, uh, that that you wanted to talk about it a bit more. And, and as we've been talking, I suppose what's popped into my head is that there are two different aspects I'm thinking of here now. Um, one is um, how the metaverse might be used as a place for us to work and engage um, with other people. And the second is as a place to help us operate and manage buildings as well. And you spoke a little bit about, about digital twins. So, you know, so what are your thoughts about, first of all, how we use the metaverse as a place to work, but also how we might use the metaverse through something like digital twins to help us manage buildings? Yeah, definitely. Um, so taking how we kind of use it to work in, um, I think, you know, Already we see the use of um, VR and, um, and augmented reality um, kind of coming into play a little bit in, in, in work at the minute because of, you know, we're, we use different kind of, you know, I think almost every company is using Miro boards and things like that, where you've got these kind of digital spaces that you're um, collaborating and, and sharing ideas. I think what we'll start to see is actually that happening more and more inside the physical building so for example you know we've all got zoom headsets at the minute what if we all also have kind of the the ar glasses and you know you you walk around the office and you put them on and you can see you know over in that corner there's a there's a virtual whiteboard so you get everyone together in your team you all go around the virtual whiteboard you interact with it you you're brainstorming ideas but also it means that employees from different locations um can also be part of that session and not um you know they can write on the board just as kind of easily as you can you, you're all kind of having um an equal experience in that in that sphere um, so I think that's going to be really exciting in terms of enabling lots of kind of cross country collaboration, but also um, cross ability um, collaboration as well. I think I think that's really important. You know, workplaces are still so far behind um, where they should be when we're thinking about accessibility for people of different um, physical abilities. And, and actually, you know, if there are these equal spaces where everyone can, can get together, then it just enables lots of different points of view to all come together, which I think is, you know, that's, that's where magic happens, right? That's, that's the most exciting thing. Right. So not only should our physical buildings um, definitely be coming up to scratch with enabling accessibility for people of um, all different um, abilities to come in, um, but also the the kind of the metaverse um, and having spaces where everybody can interact no matter their location, I think is is going to be really, really key um, and really exciting. Um, and then uh, the other thing you mentioned was the the digital twin and and yeah. um, and how it can help us actually run the buildings. So um, Revit has already, you know, revolutionized the the kind of architecture world uh, and it's been going for i think it like i'm going to sound really silly here but i think it's been going for about 15 years or something like that so it's really you know it is it's really well established and it is brilliant because you can you can model things within these digital twins before um implementing them in the real world so you can see you know oh my gosh if we do that that becomes kind of structurally problematic in this area or you know you don't have to spend loads of money kind of um fixing problems as they come up you can model it all see where those problems are and solve them before before it's begun so i think that's really good i also think it already um you've got kind of smart building systems where it does it monitors the the operational side of the building so it's monitoring or it's collecting data all the time on how many people are in, where are they in, what are they using, 
which lights need to be on, which heating systems need to be on, which ones don't. And actually, you know, if you've got if you've got loads of people on floor one and only one person on floor two, can you give them a call? Say, do you mind going down to floor one? And we'll just we'll 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 close floor two for today. And, and we're about to get to cold. Go. Come on down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come and join people. Um, you're in the office for a reason. Um, but uh, yeah, and and you know, you know, we can close down that kind of second floor and save on the heating and and the lighting and and all the things going on there. So I think it's already able to do that. I think in in uh, 27 years time in in 2050, it will just be so much more kind of automatic and seamless. Yeah. So that person before they've even walked into the building we'll get things saying by the way you know we're estimating because of the data of what we can see in people's calendars in what we know your habits are we think that you're coming into the office today would you mind sitting on floor two well, sorry on floor one uh because we're gonna you know shut down floor two you know press here to talk to um you know maria the head of facilities if actually you want something else, you know, again, the, the person and the, the human element is still going to be important. Yeah. Um, but I just think it'll, it'll be so much more seamless. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so the, the, the last thing we wanted to talk about were, were challenges because as ever, we're, we're, we're all human. Uh, so uh, the thing that uh, really challenges is change. And we've, we've kind of been talking a lot about change and how some of the things that will be going on in inside offices will, will change really quite significantly. So, so what do you see as the key challenges um, uh, that arise and uh, what might we need to overcome for a successful uh, future workplaces? And, and, and what can businesses do? to mitigate against them? Um, I, I think that's a great, a great question. And um, and I think there's a couple of different answers. So the first um, kind of challenge that I see is that, you know, we're talking about um, augmented reality and we're talking about virtual reality and, and things like that. But I, I do worry about um, how that kind of affects uh, the human the human the human element um you know we 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 know that loneliness is kind of um epidemic at the minute right we we know that people are feeling more isolated and and i think that making sure that our physical environment um is able to kind of help us to build a sense of community kind of keep connection to our company's values and encourage camaraderie between colleagues is going to be really 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 important because um if physical proximity becomes less frequent then we need to be ensuring that the health and well-being of our teammates is still strong and that we're still kind of connected to a wider purpose um so i think thinking about how the office fits in with the context of community is going to be super, super, super important. So it it needs to be integrated into the fabric of the surrounding neighbourhood in a really meaningful and accessible way. So, you know, I've, I've mentioned a couple of times about um, offices also being able to double up as spaces for community groups, but it, that shouldn't be a, a kind of tick box exercise. That should be about something of like, we're here, we're part of this neighborhood and we really care about people around us. And so we want this space to be kind of inclusive and accommodate diverse needs and reduce accessibility barriers and encourage people to come into the space and, and connect with one another, whether that is in a um, in a working um, capacity, whether that's in a volunteering capacity, um, whether that's in a relaxing capacity, you know, or a, or a sports capacity. I think there, there's so many things that, that we can do and we are already seeing how important it is to make um, health and wellness and social amenities the norm within workplaces. You know, you've got, um, the developments like um, the White Collar Factory in Old Street in London that was built, you know, seven years ago, something like that, maybe even longer. And it's got a running track on the roof. You know, that's at the time that was seen as a novelty. Um, but now it, it just it makes sense. So I think that looking at how 
we turn the dial up on that and um, and really kind of use these these buildings as a platform for positive social impact through uh, community outreach or um, local organisations or even just spaces that kind of spark joy that you get that oh you know kind of a hard moment or that that kind of oh this is really cool this is this is great um I think it's going to bring people together and facilitate kind of new and interesting conversations um which is you know is the point right that's that's the whole point of offices is that it, it brings people together and, and facilitates conversation and, and work so I think it'll be it'll be even more exciting if we know that those buildings are having a positive um, social impact and environmental impact. Well, I suppose what's uh, what's been absolutely fascinating for me is uh, we've spoken quite a lot about the different types of, of technology, whether it's metaverse, whether it's new materials, um, uh, whether it's intelligent um, uh, building management systems. But I guess at the end of the day, the technology is actually the easy bit the things that you're talking about that are more complex and, and perhaps deserve more attention even than, than the physical stuff um, is how do we integrate the technology with creating new cultures for new ways of working in new types of office space? And how do we adapt our behaviours? Because sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm almost tempted to think that when people talk about hybrid working or, or remote working, they try to put that in the context of what we've come used to understanding as normal behaviors and normal culture those need to change as well don't they and perhaps that's the harder piece yeah yeah completely and i mean i'm in change management so <laughs> i know how resistant people are to change and you know and, and i am too i think change is always really frightening and and as you say lots of the things that i've been talking about we're going to have to be really, really, really comfortable with changes. But even even just in the idea that that whole piloting and test space where, you know, it's adapting and collecting data and things like that, and then the next day it'll look different. Like, we're going to have to become comfortable with that. But I do think that we will. So I, I think that's kind of the, you know, if you think about 1996 to now, like, fax machines were still being used yes, yes. and like like I don't think anyone now is is kind of going oh you know I really miss my fax machine yes. um, so so like <laughs> you know we can we can really we can we can become comfortable with change but I think that there there's a in order to have um comfortable change you have to have a sense of security and the sense of why it's happening, the purpose of the change. So I think that being really comfortable with the security of, you know, yes, it might all look different, but there's still space for you. There's still, it's still accessible for you. It's still welcoming for you. We still um, value you as a person and you coming in. Like, I think that's going to be really, really key. Um, and that kind of psychological safety. Um, but but also, um, yeah, the the kind of the purpose of it's changing because this is a better use of the space today, and 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 um, you know, it means that actually tonight we can host a, a creative arts collective to come in and do like some digital murals that are then going to be projected onto the walls of all of our buildings for the next week. Like I don't know, you know, there's 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 a lot that you can do with purpose. I think that'll be that'll be key. It's uh, whenever I have these kind of conversations, you, you always get the sense at the moment where we're at a point in, in, in time where actually the future is limited by our imagination. And, and I think you've kind of opened um, uh, some of the uh, some of the imagined futures here, which uh, which has been really interesting. Um, Harriet, thank you so much for your time. That's been absolutely fascinating. Brilliant. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Do let your friends and colleagues know about the Informing Choices mini pod, and we'll have another episode for you very soon.